Welcome to Open Book, Episode 16, How to Read John Milton's Paradise Lost, Books 5 to 6. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's episode is our fourth of seven episodes on Milton's epic poem, covering books 5 and 6. The middle third of Paradise Lost, books 5 through 8, are wholly comprised of an extended conversation between Adam and the Archangel Raphael, in which they tell each other their respective stories. First, Raphael, in 5 and 6, relates the story of the war in heaven, how God elevated his son above all the angels, and how his fellow archangel, Lucifer, led a failed rebellion and was defeated and driven down to hell with his fellow rebels, which fills in events leading up to the start of Book 1. In Books 7 and 8, Raphael is going to recount how God then created the universe and this world and then put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And in return, Adam will tell Raphael his own origin story, including his earliest memories and his request for a female companion, thus filling in the story up to the beginning of Book 4, when Satan arrived in Eden. And this whole extended conversation, by the way, takes less than half a day. But the latter part is for our next episode. So to the war in heaven. In this episode, then, I'll take you up to the moment that Raphael begins telling his story, and then I will walk you through what transpires in the war in heaven. And of course, also talk about why it is that Raphael is telling Adam this extended backstory, this inset uh, background story that comes right in the center, in these, the central four books of Paradise Lost. The initial motive is for God to warn Adam and Eve that Satan is conspiring or planning to lead them astray. Adam then naturally asks Raphael, who is this Satan you speak of? And Raphael tells him the story. So that's the motive for the narrative. What about the motive for Milton himself? Why does Milton include this extended backstory in the middle of Paradise Lost? Partly it's because it allows him to play with chronological structures. That is to say that he's begun this, as you might remember from episode one, he begins this story in medias race, that is in the middle of things. And so he now has to provide the necessary origins. He has to go back and, and uh, flesh out how it was that that was the middle. What was the, what was the beginning? The other reason for Milton is that the poem, Paradise Lost, originates in, of course, the book of Genesis in the Bible. And that gives it certain limits. But in these books, in books five through eight, Milton can be a lot more inventive. The War in Heaven is not a biblical story. Milton plays with different theories of how angels might be able to fall. That is a matter of huge and, and uh, active conjecture among theologians of Milton's time. Milton thus is able to emphasize the human qualities and, and failings of angels. For instance, their pride and their envy. We begin book five just where we ended book four. Adam and Eve were sleeping in their bower, and Satan was, you might recall, squat like a toad whispering in her ear, giving her dreams. The, the content of the dream is now what we are going to learn. What we learn is that it is exactly a rehearsal for book nine when, spoiler alert, this is precisely what is going to happen to Eve. Well, more or less. Let's see what happens. Starting at line 50, she describes how to Adam in the next morning, how she had a dream in which she was brought suddenly to the tree of interdicted knowledge, that is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which they are forbidden to eat from. 
and she encounters there an angel who is standing by the tree and speaking in praise of it, saying, Oh, fair plant, in line 58, is knowledge so despised, etc. He plucked and tasted, and then Eve is filled with horror. And she says then that the angel spoke in praise of the intellectual powers of this fruit, line 69. Forbidden here, it seems, as only fit for gods, yet able to make gods of men. That's a really important notion, by the way, all the way through books five through eight, is, and that is the way that men, if they continue to follow God's edicts, they will someday become angelic. They will someday rise up and become more godlike. And so eating of the tree of knowledge, eating of the forbidden fruit, is a kind of a false circumvention. In fact, it, it's not a circumvention. It actually breaks the, the procedure or I should say the progress toward that end that God has intended. So this angel in, uh, in Eve's dream, uh, line 77, says to Eve, taste this and be henceforth among the gods thyself a goddess. And she does, she does what he, she tastes it. She rises up to the clouds in an exalted way. She beholds the earth, earth outstretched immense in line 88, a prospect wide and various, wondering at my flight and changed to this high exaltation before ultimately descending back to earth. Adam tells her effectively, don't worry about thinking of evil. There's no blame to simply think of it and contemplate it. This is lines 116 following. Be not sad, he says, evil into the mind of God or man may come and go so unapproved and leave no spot or blame behind. So contemplating evil is not committing it. And this is naturally very reassuring to Eve. She has no intention. She has dread and fear and horror at the idea of committing such an evil. And she is reassured to know that simply imagining it is, is okay. This is, by the way, going to be a really key problem for Eve later on in Book 9. That is to say that sometimes imagining a thing and then acting on the thing is an easy transition to make, too easy in her case. Adam and Eve then sing a lovely extended hymn to the morning, to all the creatures of, of earth and water, to the planets, to all of nature, to angels and stars and the sun and everything else. And finally, they resume their garden labors, including this description of them not just um, cropping the branches that have overgrown, but in line 215, leading the vine to wed her elm. She, the vine, spoused about him, twines her marriageable arms, and with her brings her dower the adopted clusters to adorn his barren leaves. A very clear extended metaphor, that is, of marriage and of the ways that feminine fertility is necessary for the propagation of natural growth like her adopted clusters and so on but also the way that a, a very frequent in this period metaphor of the way that um, men and women are supposed to be relating to each other. That is a very patriarchal notion of female dependence on the strength, solidity, rightness, straightness, etc. of the male elm, the, the female vine sort of climbing up that established and solid form. You can kind of see that uh, not just in metaphors like this, but all the way through this sort of discourse that Adam and Eve have with one another. But anyway, soon enough, God, who's watching from above, sends Raphael down to Earth with an assignment. Going back to the argument to Book 5, it says that, quote, God, to render man inexcusable, sends Raphael to admonish him of his obedience, of his free estate, of his enemy near at hand, who he is and why his enemy and whatever else may avail Adam to know. And in line 234, God says to Raphael, advise him, Adam, of his happy state. Tell him, for instance, 
that he stands in this state only through his free will. Happiness in his power left free to will, line 235. Left to his own free will, his will, will though free yet mutable. God is, let it be said, kind of belaboring the point, but we've seen this before. Book 3, lines 99, lines 115, God has said exactly these things. Sufficient though to stand, yet free to fall, as I think the line. And he wants to say, look, don't forget that you are in a position of choice you there are dangers around you around you tell him with all his danger and from whom what enemy etc lines 239 38 to 39 and so on and how god satan is going to try to not use violence in order to overthrow your state of bliss he says but deceit and lies Jumping ahead a little bit, lines 525 to 540 are the warning itself. Let's look at those in in brief. God made the perfect not immutable, etc., says Raphael, but to persevere, he left it in thy power, ordained thy will by nature free, not overruled by fate, etc. And then the words free and voluntary and necessity and freely we serve because we freely love as in our will to love or not in this we stand or fall are very important words obviously for Raphael he then mentions the rebels in passing by the way which is then Adam's um, cue to ask him wait rebels tell me more I would like to understand who they are I would also refer you to, jumping way further ahead, to the very end of Raphael's extended narration. At the end of book six, line 894 through 910, Raphael actually issues the extended warning. Uh, Listen not to his temptations, he concludes, warn thy weaker, that is, Eve, let it profit thee to have heard by terrible example the reward of disobedience. So Satan's story of the the rebellion in heaven is very absolutely, certainly supposed to be a cautionary tale. And the word warning is really um, resonant or significant, I think, because if you think back to the beginning of book four, the moment when um, Satan has approached or come to Eve, Uh, Milton has begun book four with this memorable phrase, Oh, for that warning voice, which he who saw the apocalypse heard cry in heaven, etc., that now our first parents, continuing on, had been warned the coming of their secret foe. Well, guess what? They were warned repeatedly, or at least Adam was warned. And the question then is, did he really pass this along to Eve the way he ought to have done. Milton has unfortunately orchestrated a great deal of Raphael's visit to, or rather Raphael's narration of of, uh, Lucifer slash Satan's story to be outside of the earshot of Eve, that she has not heard all of this, and Adam is just kind of supposed to pass along the gist of it to her later on. A very fateful and poor decision. Anyway, I want to now get to one of the key features um, of the uh, books five and six, and that is on the meta level, how they are stories of things that cannot be described in words. Milton, we know all the way through Paradise Lost, is using extended similes, partly because he is very learned, he wants to exhibit that, but it's not just ego, it's also because the there's a cosmic scale to the stories that he's telling. He wants to compare things to greater things. He wants to explain the nature of the universe, and he wants us to understand everything in, in, in uh, comparative terms. But also, all the way through books five and six, he's going to use uh, similes in both local and extended kind of longitudinal ways in order to describe stuff that is indescribable. Let's look at one of those local examples. I mean, Raphael's approach to the world. Look at how Milton describes it through a series of similes that begin on lines 257. 
From hence, no cloud or to obstruct his sight star interposed, however small, he, Raphael, sees not unconform to other shining globes, earth and the garden of God with cedars crowned above all hills, as when by night the glass of Galileo, less assured, observes imagined lands and regions in the moon. Galileo made his observations of the moon using a very recent invention and advance in optics in the 17th century of the telescope or perspective glass that Galileo had used uh, and had improved based on Dutch designs. Uh, he discovered, among other things, the, the rings of Saturn, the um, moons of Jupiter, things that hadn't been seen before. But here Milton is talking about the moon, and very, very attentive readers will recognize that this isn't the first time that Milton has mentioned Galileo. This was cast your mind all the way back to book one with a description of Satan's shield. Book one, lines 286 following. The broad circumference hung on his shoulders like the moon whose orb through the optic glass the Tuscan artist views at evening from the top of Fezzole, or in Valdarno, to descry new lands, rivers, or mountains in her spotty globe. And I think Milton's motive for, or rather his fascination, his motive for fascination with the telescope is because the telescope is an instrument that extends the capabilities both of the human eye and of the human mind. The eye can perceive and then the mind can conceive, sometimes literally perceiving things, sometimes metaphorically. We were, we started all of this, by the way, I started all of this by talking about uh, Raphael looking to the earth and um, as if he were like Galileo. Then, to return to Book 5, about 266 following, we get descriptions of Raphael himself. Actually, it's 271 following. To all fowls he appears, or sorry, he seems a phoenix. So this is the self-creating bird that's, well, self-immolating bird that regenerates after death. Kind of like Christ, who will resurrect, be resurrected, that is, after his death, a, an image that is quite common in Christian um, iconography. When, in uh, lines 276 following, uh, Raphael, quote, to his proper shape returns, uh, we're left to wonder whether these metaphors of of the of the telescope of the of the of the moon of the um, of the phoenix were literal metamorphoses. There's a sort of blurry line between uh, truth and poetry, between uh, metamorphosis and metaphor. And this is really suitable to Raphael because that becomes a recurring theme in all of Raphael's discourse that. Everything he's going to describe, actually, and say, everything he's going to say is a metaphor. Uh, for instance, all of the um, swords and battles that, uh, that angels engage with are, are mere metaphors in order to permit human understanding, in, in order for humans to um, conceive in, uh, of things that they have difficulty conceiving of without these metaphors. I am referring to lines 571 following in book uh, 5. Uh, Raphael says, What surmounts the reach of human sense I shall delineate so by likening spiritual to corporal forms as may express them best. And that's uh, something that we would be forgiven for forgetting uh, all the way through. It's very hard for as after all, we are mere human readers. It's kind of hard for us to think how this might be unmetaphorized, uh, uh, how it may be literalized. But you get a glimpse of this early in book six. I'm looking at line 297 following, when Raphael asks, For who, though with the tongue of angels, can relate, or to what things like an unearth conspicuous, that may lift human imagination to such height of godlike power? That syntax is a little bit tangled, but he's asking there what things on earth, what conspicuous things, things that we are capable of witnessing or looking at on earth, can we compare these high stories with? Um, and he, he sort of does this, actually. What he says in line 310 following 
is even possibly a bit more disorienting. Such as, he says, to set forth great things by small. And well, he's, t- he's talking, just a second, he's talking about um, the, the fight between Lucifer, as he was then known, or Satan, as he will be known, and Michael. Um, and the, the commotion, that is the commotion in line 310. The commotion such as to set forth great things by small, if nature's concord broke, among the constellations war were sprung, two planets rushing from aspect malign of fiercest opposition in mid-sky should combat and their jarring spheres compound. So we had um, first the question of what might I use that is conspicuous, that is visible to humans, that will help you understand how momentous this is. Ah, I know. If I want to um, set forth great things by small, comparatively, I will give you the example of warring planets. Um, And so that's not small by human estimation, (laughs) to say the least. And yet, compared to fighting angels, uh, it is a small fight. And as we've seen again a couple of times, humans are capable of looking at planets, especially through the new technology of telescopes, and both seeing them as smaller than they really are, that is visible to the eye, that you can look at it as a, as a small image in your telescope. And consequently, you are capable of, of thinking, of conceiving of what the moon or a planet is. Anyway, I'm jumping around quite a lot, and so let's stop that. Let's move a bit more more directly, in a more linear way through book five. As I said earlier, in order to prove to Adam that angels have faced the same questions of free will, uh, etc., that um, man now faces, Raphael allows um, in uh, book five, around line, Uh, 540 following, that a couple of the angels have fallen. He says, some are fallen to disobedience fallen, and so from heaven to deepest hell. This really provokes Adam's curiosity, and he very much wants to hear the story. And that is a theme that recurs all the way through uh, these books, these internal um, books in the middle with with Raphael telling a story. Adam has an insatiable thirst for knowledge, for mental food. He just cannot get enough. Raphael ultimately has to tell him, that's enough, Adam. I have places to be, and he takes his leave. But that's not the only reason he leaves. It's also because, as he says, look, you need to not inquire into everything. There are certain things that are simply above your your ability to understand. So Raphael begins his story uh, at line 577, and he tells the story of how God assembled the innumerable angelic hosts together to make an announcement, a decree that he has declared his only son the head of everyone. Five, uh, 607. Uh, by myself have sworn to him, sh- uh, by, shall bow all knees in heaven, he says, and shall confess him Lord. And then continuing 611, him whom disobeys me disobeys, breaks union, and that day cast out from God and blessed vision falls into utter darkness. This does not sit well with Satan, who is full of pride, full of envy, full of malice, and full of disdain. Those are all words used to describe him between about 602 and 666. And then he says to Belial, 679, new laws thou seest imposed, new laws from him who reigns, new minds may raise in us who serve, new counsels. So it is not merely that um, there are new laws, that these new laws are actually going to provoke new ways of thinking, namely (laughs) ways of being malicious and envious and, and, and proud. Satan then convenes all of his um, his thrones, dominations, princedoms, virtues, and powers, 772. That is, all of the angels under all of the sub-hierarchies of angels that are part of his dominion, over whom he has authority. And that's, an, that's important because, he, well, I suppose what's important here is that he makes a long speech in which he 
uses the word equal a number of times, quite literally 10 times between 791 and Abdiel's response up to line 866. This idea of equality is a complex one, but it's at the core of uh, Satan's feeling of, of injury that he feels, of injustice that he feels by the sun being elevated above all of the archangels. He has no problem, though, with the notion of degree. Degree is a word that gets repeated only twice, 792 and um, 838. And the idea of degree, meaning a hierarchical order in which everyone knows their place, was, was seen as a key component of the order of the universe. It sort of structured the way that both the natural world and the human societies and authorities and families and all manner of structures of hierarchy were allowed to exist. They, they existed because of degrees of difference of some being elevated over others. One of the reasons I'm picking up on that word degree is because in uh, one of Shakespeare's lesser known plays, Troilus and Cressida, written about 1602 but not published till 1609, there's a, an extended speech, one of the longest speeches in all of Shakespeare, by a character named Ulysses, in which he explains uh, or extemporizes at great length about how degree is the word, or the notion rather, that underpins all harmony in the universe. Uh, it ex uses a musical metaphor when he says, take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. That is what Satan, at least publicly, is willing to say it has been violated. The notion that degrees have meaning and stability and can't be disrupted merely by adding somebody in who is higher than all of the archangels who thought themselves at the height. So book five ends with the objections of one of the angels within um Satan's circle, that is Abdiel, who has followed him, but then is horrified to hear Satan say such things against God's decree. He foresees their fall when he says in um, 878, I see thy fall determined and thy hapless crew involved in this perfidious fraud. But we also can foresee it. We recall the way that God has said when he elevated his son, um, him who disobeys me or disobeys, but also if you don't follow him, you will be sent away. You will be sent down into hell. And the rebels are testing that assertion. In book six, the war begins in earnest. And the structure that it takes, which is conventional enough in epics, is an alternating structure between speeches, or parley, as it's called in line 296, and actions, or battles. Satan, for example, first begins by defying Abdiel, who has stood up to him, in line 164 following. He says, At first I thought that liberty in heaven to heavenly souls had been all one, but now I see that most through sloth had rather serve ministering spirits trained up in feast and song. Such hast thou, such hast thou armed the minstrelsy of heaven, servility with freedom to contend. He uses the word servility a couple of times, and sloth, by the way, I think is an echo of when Belial is in, uh, in book two, counseling what Milton calls ignoble ease and peaceful sloth or sloth. I'm not sure. It depends if you're British or American. That's how you say those words. Um, that he's going to be slothful uh, and, and, and be full of service. He's going to serve God um, as a means of self-protection. Uh, Abdiel is as is defiant and and uh, incensed that Milton. I'm sorry, that Satan would say such a thing. Uh, he says, "Apostate, line one seventy two. Still thou erst, nor end wilt find of erring from the path of truth remote. Unjustly thou depravest it with the name of servitude, 
to serve whom God ordains or nature. So Abdiel is quite incensed that um, this word servility or servitude would be used. And that gives you very strong, I think, context for what Satan is going to say then in um, book one. You recall that when he says it is better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. All of this language that Abdiel is using of service, again in line 180, he says, in fact, uh, reign thou in hell thy kingdom. This is line 183. Let me serve in heaven God ever blessed and his divine behests obey, worthiest to be obeyed. Michael then uh, arrives, the archangel, and defies Satan around line 275. And Satan actually claims, he thinks, that's, that hell might be a fable. What does he say? Line 290 following. Um, he says, this, uh, callst thou, this strife which thou callst evil, but we style the strife of glory, which we, we mean to win, or turn this heaven itself into the hell thou fablest. That reminds me of Christopher Marlowe's play, Dr. Faustus, in which the German um, ne necromancer and doctor makes a, a pact with the devil, to whose representative, Mephistopheles, Faustus says, come, I think hell's a fable. And Mephistopheles replies, I think so still till experience change thy mind. Soon enough, the combat between Michael and Satan begins. And this is a moment in which we learn a great deal more about the way that angels' bodies work and how their nectarous humors flowed sanguine in lines 333 to 4 um, flow through their bodies. Uh, this is something that when, when Michael attacks first Satan and cuts right through his body, all his right side in 327, there's this gash that, that flows out, this angelic blood-like substance. Yet, here's what we learn about his body, 344. Yet soon he healed for spirits that live throughout vital in every part um, have that is to say, they have vital, their vital organs are in every part of their bodies. All heart they live, 350. All head, all eye, all ear, all intellect, all sense. This is going to get, by the way, far more explicit in, I think, book seven, when Raphael discusses angelic sex lives. But we're learning for now, in books five and six, a great deal more about the way that angels look. We've learned, for example, in uh, book five, lines 277 following, that Raphael has six wings on his body. And Milton is quite preoccupied all the way through, as we've seen, but also, particularly in these books, between uh, he's preoccupied with bodies and their beauty and the love that you can feel for this beauty, love and admiration, and love that is pure. If you go back to book five for a moment, when Adam approaches uh, Raphael, he has a sort of stately beauty in himself. Lines 350 following. Meanwhile, our primitive great sire, to meet his godlike guest, that is Raphael, walks forth without more train accompanied than with his own complete perfections. In himself was all his state more solemn than the tedious pomp that waits on princes, etc., etc. So he has this extraordinary innate grandeur. Milton then will not lose the opportunity to praise Eve's spectacular beauty, uh, lines 446 through 50. If ever then, then had the sons of God excuse to have been enamored at that sight, this is the sight of Eve's nakedness, but in those hearts love unlibidinous reigned, nor jealousy was understood the injured lover's hell. So this is a, a purity of love. This is the a moment that we should probably recall the initial description from the last uh, episode of their nakedness, the purity of their beauty. Returning then to uh, book six, it's not just us, the readers, who are learning things about angelic bodies. Actually, Satan himself learns. Look at uh, lines 430 through 36. Satan is reflecting on the injury that he has suffered and says that true is less firmly armed, some disadvantage we endured, and pain till now not known, 
but known as soon contemned, since now we find that this our imperial form incapable of mortal injury, imperishable, and though pierced with wounds, soon closing and by native vigor healed. So th this is the first injury that has he has ever encountered, that any of them have ever encountered. And so they understand their nature, their invincibility, their immortality now for the first time. The rebel angels, though, having suffered this defeat, now have to come up with a new tactic. And so they invent gunpowder and the cannon. Look at lines 472 through 91, which are worth a close reading. Satan is speaking to one named Nisroch and says to him, Which of us who beholds the bright surface of this ethereous mold that is the, the ground, the surface of, of heaven, whereon we stand, this continent of spacious heaven adorned with plant, fruit, flower, ambrosial gems, and gold, whose eye so superficially surveys these things as not to mind from whence they grow. So where do all of these materials originate? As he says, deep underground, materials dark and crude of spiritus and fiery spume till, touched with heaven's ray and tempered, they shoot forth so beauteous, opening to the ambient light. This notion of materials dark and crude is an echo, I think, of the, uh, the line 916 in book two, his dark materials whereon to create new worlds, all these origins of this material, um, this mass of chaos that, is, that God is going to use and fashion. Material means raw material. It means something that is dark and crude, something that needs to be refined, something that the heaven's ray is able to turn into what its potential is. So in other words, fire is capable of realizing that potential. That's a natural process that Satan perceives is happening everywhere in, in heaven. And it's a natural process that he says they can harness and control and shape to their will. Look what he says in line 482 uh, following. These in their dark nativity, the deep shall yield us pregnant with infernal flame, which into hollow engines, long and round, thick rammed, at the other, bore with touch of fire dilated in furiate, and in furiate, shall send forth from far with thundering noise among our foes such implements of mischief as shall dash to pieces and o'erwhelm whatever stands adverse, that they shall fear we have disarmed the thunderer of his only dreaded bolt. So they are going to take the materials that God's heavenly ray is capable of turning into all manner of beautiful creations. They're going to, in one way of thinking, pervert that course. They're going to commandeer those materials in order to change their outcomes to destruction. And they, resultantly their enemy, shall fear we have disarmed the thunder of his only dreaded bolt. They are, in other words, stealing the thunder from God. This is where we originate the notion of stealing someone's thunder. The rebel angels then are full of self-congratulation. They look at what they've invented, the canon, uh, line 498 following, and um, each of them admires it. The invention all admired, and each how he to be the inventor missed, so easy it seemed once found, which yet unfound most would have thought impossible. This is like every great discovery. It's obvious to everyone, but only after it gets discovered. Then Raphael turns to Adam and gives him, as he is custom, accustomed to doing, gives him a warning. Yet happily of thy race, Raphael's aside to Adam says, in future days, if malice should abound, someone intent on mischief or inspired with devilish, ma devilish machination might devise like instrument to plague the sons of men for sin on war and mutual slaughter bent. You know, just in case that might happen, which of course it's going to happen, but Adam, being innocent, sort of lets the, the, this message just sort of pass by him. The cannon wreaks enormous havoc among the loyal angels, and 
in fact, what, what it leads to is an escalation on both sides so that they actually resort to, if you, if you can get your head around this, they resort to throwing mountains, the mountains of heaven themselves um, at each other. This uh, sort of between 637 and 669, um, the, the, this is described. Uh, forthwith, says Raphael, their arms away they threw and to the hills in 639. They plucked the seated hills in 644 with all their load, rocks, waters, woods, and by the shaggy tops uplifting, bore them in their hands and then throw them at each other. The rest uh, then take the, so hills, look at uh, 664, so hills amid the air encountered hills hurled to and fro with jaculation dire that underground they fought in dismal shade, infernal noise. War seemed a civil game to this uproar, horrid confusion heaped upon confusion rose. And this is when it pauses in the middle of that line, 669, and now all heaven had or would have gone to rack with ruin or spread overspread had not the almighty father where he sits etc foreseen this tumult he says and then he sends forward his son so the son then gets sent in god intervenes so that the son will have the glory of a military triumph also because the war will just go on forever unless someone resolves it. 693, God says, in perpetual fight they needs must last endless and no solution will be found. It soon becomes clear that you really do not want to cross God, whose creative power is extraordinary. His power of love, his justice, etc. is extraordinary. But his terror is also unspeakable. He says to the son in 734, whom thou hate, sorry, the son says to God, whom thou hatest, I hate and can put on thy terrors as I put thy mildness on. And terrors is a word that's going to recur. Milton will just describe the son into terror changed his countenance too severe to be beheld and full of wrath bent on his enemies. That's uh, 824 to 26. He mounts his crystal chariot and rides out into the field in, on, the th on this third day of battle and fully just ends things right there. Yet half his strength he put not forth, Milton says in 853, but checked his thunder in mid-volley, for he meant not to destroy but root them out of heaven. Look at the description of how he does so, 856 following. The overthrown he raised, and as a herd of goats or timorous flock together thronged, drove them before him thunderstruck, pursued with terrors, there's that word again, and with furies to the bounds and crystal wall of heaven, which, opening wide, rolled inward, and a spacious gap disclosed into the wasteful deep. The monstrous, uh, the monstrous sight struck them, that's a word, struck them with horror backward, but far worse, urged them behind. Headlong themselves they threw down from the verge of heaven. Eternal wrath burnt after them to the bottomless pit. And so Raphael concludes his story in order to warn Adam of Satan's intention in order, and in order to inform readers of Paradise Lost what happened before book one. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is on Volume 2 of Jane Austen's novel, Northanger Abbey. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname, U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email. Elliot at U Calgary, that's U C A L G A R Y dot C A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well Tempered Clavier Project. 
and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Mm-hmm.